Um, I rise to support this bill in general and specifically to support the Government's decision to reject Lord's Amendment No. 10. Now, it continues to be a matter of great regret that in a country like ours it should be necessary to legislate to protect free speech, but we have reached the point where this clearly needs to be done. Freedom of speech is the cornerstone of any democratic society, and in a society like ours it should be a given, because throughout history philosophers have understood that creativity and progress in a society depend on actions, sorry, acts of intellectual rebellion, dissent, disagreement and controversy, no matter how uncomfortable they may be. To a very large degree, freedom of speech matters most when it is controversial because this is how pre-existing thinking can be challenged and how new ideas can develop. And in a democratic and free society, discussion, challenge and debate are healthy. And our universities have traditionally been at the forefront of this battle of ideas. As I stated at the second reading of this bill, universities should be a place where ideas are freely exchanged, tested and, yes, criticised as well. But in recent years, free speech, particularly on university campuses, has increasingly been eroded. Now, I served on the bill committee for this bill, uh, and the evidence that we took from eminent academics was deeply worrying, so much so that I really do wonder if the Honourable Member for Warwick and Lymington was actually listening. Because evidence was given of the chilling effect in universities where academics feel obliged to self-censor for fear of consequences of daring to express views that do not accord with an increasingly intolerant monoculture. One of our witnesses was Dr Arif Ahmed, a reader in philosophy at the University of Cambridge, and he informed the House, as my right honourable friend, uh, the member for uh, Holland and Deepings has said, that a 2017 UCU survey found that 35% of academics felt obliged to self-censor. To paraphrase Dr Ahmed, many academics are not speaking their minds or pursuing important research simply because they fear disciplinary action from their universities or from being ostracised by their peers. Professor Matthew Goodwin from the University of Kent told the committee that not only does this affect academics, but a quarter of students are also self-censoring. If academic freedom is under threat, so too is the freedom of speech. Another one of our witnesses was Professor Kathleen Stock, who at the time was still at the University of Sussex, but was shortly afterwards finally hounded from her job after enduring an entire year of bullying, marginalisation and intimidation. In recent years, we've, there have been repeated accounts of speakers whose views do not correspond with the prevailing monocultural mindset, being disinvited from speaking engagements, reading, reading lists being censored, publishing contracts cancelled, reputations trashed, and safe spaces created where nothing but the prevailing view is permitted to be heard. The truth is that this is not about protecting delicate sensibilities from offence, it's really about censorship. After all, in a free society, people can always protect their sensibilities if they wish to, by not going to the speech, by not watching the film, by not reading the book. Nobody is compelled to engage if they do not wish to. But when people are explicitly or indirectly no platformed, those who take such decisions are not protecting themselves. They are denying others the right to hear those people and to challenge what is said, and this is exceptionally damaging. If dissent and debate at university can be silenced, then it can be silenced elsewhere too. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I outlined at the beginning of my speech, I cannot support Lord's Amendment No. 10, which attempts to remove Clause 4 of the Bill, and the reason for this is that this clause is what gives this legislation its teeth. Removing it would reduce much of this Bill to impotence. As my honourable friend, the Member for East Surrey, has said, retaining it, and I'm quoting, will be crucial in securing the cultural and behavioural shift needed in our higher education sector. I stand firm in my belief that the tort is an essential part of this bill. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I entirely agree. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish to close my contribution by quoting George Orwell, who wrote, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. George Orwell's words, Madam Deputy Speaker, remain just as apposite today as they did when he wrote them nearly eight decades ago. This bill protects that liberty and I fully support it. Yeah.